Alright guys, we're going to Formula 1 news with all the drama happening so far this weekend on the Red Bull Racing car, the adjustable front bib option that was still a big story of today. Max Verstappen responds emphatically, putting his car on pole position for the first time in any format since all the way back in June. A massively important day potentially in the Drivers' Championship. The upgrades seem to be working for Red Bull Racing. Not so much in McLaren with Lando Norris having a difficult time today. There's no doubt about it, but if there was anything true on this whole front bib adjustment theory, could we expect Red Bull's race pace tomorrow to not be quite as strong. Very much enjoyed to your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. We are going to get into this image here over the coming minutes. But firstly, we're going to start with a few things. Upgrades arrived today in Force McLaren with a major upgrade package onto their car. We talked about the risk of bringing in upgrades because... At this point in the regulatory cycle, when the cars are relatively close to their theoretical performance ceiling, if you bring new parts, especially parts that increase the downforce, what's that going to do for balance, especially with one practice session on a circuit which is still bumpy in places, difficult to put together a car which is going to be spectacular everywhere and that may well have been what McLaren struggled with today but it's not like Red Bull also didn't bring their own set of significant upgrades because they most certainly did but McLaren had seven new parts on their car and um, they only had one of the new front wing specs available so uh, I think they both used it during FP1 and then it's gone on Lando's car and we've got to talk about Piastri as well because that was a bit of a disaster class today. Now Mercedes also with some major upgrades and look their car today was quick enough for pole position. They're usually good around this track. I'm sure they'll be relatively pleased with how today went and it seems like they did start to dial in some of their upgrades but the end of qualifying again did not quite go to plan. Sprint qualifying at least of course for the sprint tomorrow after which Park Ferme then reopens. The teams are allowed to make changes and then it's locked again for qualifying and then of course the main race in Sunday evening my time but Mercedes with a major package this weekend actually if you guys can see here the old or the top level is basically the old version the bottom level is now the newer version the new redefined Cypod inlet so some quite significant changes Mercedes have made seemingly to the floor of the car as well we believe for the Red Bull lots of the changes they made were generally underground so we can't really see them but um, they have made some other changes elsewhere but the big drama again of today was first Further updates on this whole Red Bull Racing exploit, shall we say. The ability to change the height of the front bib, the tea tray, whatever you want to call it, which could potentially affect performance between qualifying and the race. The theory goes it doesn't necessarily make their car faster overall, but it allows them to have less of a compromise in terms of whatever they choose for quali has to be what they choose for the race, which is the rules, let's not forget. Red Bull say nothing like this was happening, it's a complete non-issue, and it may well be but um, the question, of course, from the other teams, and especially McLaren, that have made this very clear today, is that, well, if they have that tool, how can we be sure they haven't been using it in this way? And even Zach Brown was being quite clear that when Red Bull said, oh, well, you know, it's inaccessible, this device, when the car is put together inaccessible doesn't necessarily mean inoperable and that was kind of like Zach Brown basically said they chose their words quite carefully we'll get to that in a second but um yeah Lando Norris says it's one thing having it on the car it's obviously another how you might exploit this but today an article by Speed Cafe came out explaining what they believe and what basically is required to operate this um adjustment so the key drama really is the fact that every other team on the grid to make this adjustment it's done outside the car probably on the bottom of the car somewhere someone you know puts a tool in they make a, an adjustment and that changes the ride height for whatever reason Red Bull have designed it so that the point to which you can change this is inside the cockpit and obviously people are going to wonder well you know given all the other teams the convention is to do it from outside because presumably it's easier to access having it inside the cockpit obviously raises questions as to precisely why they would do that, especially if, you know, they're not trying to hide it from anyone. That's the theory anyway. But um, it's obviously this facility exists. Red Bull admitted that it does, but they're like, well, we're not using it to do what you think we're doing effectively under park firm A conditions. Now, it seems like the screw mechanism is located under the heel support, essentially the element that supports the driver's feet and requires the use of a tool to adjust it to be 
accessed, mechanics must remove the nose cone, a separate panel, and a carbon section, and we'll see this separate panel in a second. I'm not exactly sure whether the nose cone has to be gone or not. That maybe is quite important, but uh, we'll see it in a second. And the carbon section within the footwell in a process that requires multiple mechanics if you want to perform it quickly. The ability to perform those actions under park fermé conditions without attracting the ire of officials is therefore slim, which seems fair enough impossible? You know, maybe not. And that, of course, is the question. And also, Red Bull then talked about this plan going forward, which obviously reminded many of what happened with the Ferrari engine in 2019, when they're like, oh, well, it's definitely not an illegal engine, but uh, we've, we've come to an arrangement with the FIA. We've just had a conversation, right? So this type of stuff. But apparently, they're not really going to change anything, although there was another article today that said they will be making changes to the car Red Bull before Brazil, so that, you know, they can be satisfied the FEA, they can't do this. Of course, for this weekend's, they're just going to slap a load of tape on it to prevent them changing it. And we'll see. Well, that was basically what we saw at the start of the video here, when after practice, the Red Bull mechanics are explaining how it's done. So you guys can see here, they remove this panel above the footwell, as it were. They've taken the nose off, and then he's reaching in with a tool to make the adjustments, which, um, you know, seems a bit more complicated than just doing it from outside of the car like every other team does. So then you've got to kind of wonder why. And um, then the FIA guys, they basically slapped a seal over this so they couldn't make any changes between, you know, after they'd made the decision what they were going to do going into sprint qualifying. So it's very interesting. The other drama on this as well is that apparently this was raised to the FIA by former Red Bull technicians. We know that McLaren have hired a number of former Red Bull guys over the last couple of years, which says a couple of things. Number one, it potentially says they've known about this or have been using this for a long time now because you know, if they hadn't, then you know, let's say guys like Rob Marshall or, you know, other Red Bull mechanics that have been around McLaren for a couple of years, but not exactly the last three months or whatever, they would have known about this if Red Bull had it for some time. And also, if it was something that didn't give a performance edge, then would they even mention it? Right? Like, if they knew the McLaren guys or, like, the Red Bull guys that have now gone to McLaren, that it was just being used as every other team use it with no competitive advantage or cheating potential in there anywhere, then why is it a problem, right? Why report it? But then again, also, you could have reported it before now, theoretically, if it was that much of a big deal, certainly in the context of a championship fight. So it seems like McLaren employees formerly working for Red Bull are basically snitching on Red Bull here. And you can argue why, especially if there is nothing to it, whether this is just a PR game to make Red Bull look bad. That's at least the argument that Red Bull internally seem to be presenting right now. But um, McLaren were not happy with what the FIA did. They wanted more, basically, and it continued today. It was actually good timing for McLaren because they did this content piece with Danica Patrick here, Zach Brown's driving around. He said an awful lot of things on this and basically made the point of, well, you know, why would you design it like that when for the other nine teams it's decided it's designed like this and he said they chose their words carefully on saying that it was inaccessible but not necessarily that it was inoperable and um you know obviously Zach Brown then says well if it's inaccessible then why do you need to seal it right like if you can't access the thing to change when the car's put together which you can't change on the park fermi according to Ripple then why would the FIA even need to seal it it's no problem but they have done so Zach Brown says it's an ongoing thing and yeah, he basically says they can't access it. The other eight teams other than McLaren can't access it, but Red Bull can. So the drama on this continues. Obviously, Red Bull have responded and said, don't know what you're talking about. This bib thing is perfectly legal, says Marco, and was known to all teams. We already informed the FIA about it. That says it all. Nothing changed it before. I don't understand the talk about it. Maybe someone wants to take attention away from other problems. Of course, we know that, well, McLaren have raised this and the reality is that McLaren probably should be closer to both of this year's championships. Well, okay, they're winning the constructors, right? But they should be closer to the drivers than they are. Marco's been calling out Lando Norris and his mentality and stuff like this over the last few days that Zach Brown is not especially happy with. This was interesting. Dr. Obbs definitely has contacts internally at Red Bull. And um, he says, what I've heard from the internal reactions is actually quite amusing. And they say, as far as they're concerned, as far as he is concerned, you know, they're raising this to cause some drama. We're in a tight battle. Public opinion, the court of a public opinion is a play in our sport. The media have eaten it up, as of course they have done. And there really is nothing to this, right? And obviously, it was not necessarily going to be seen in any sort of pure qualifying pace. The 
conversation was that if they were able to make slight adjustments between qualifying and the race, then, you know, they could set up a car great for quality and then still make it perfect for the race, hypothetically. So just because Verstappen did excellently today doesn't necessarily completely discount this possibility, but it does, of course, reduce the likelihood, especially if Max goes on to still, you know, let's say dominate tomorrow's sprint as he has done every other sprint so far this season. But plenty to dive into when we talk practice, when we talk qualifying. The Mercedes was running very close to the ground. Like Mercedes would love what Red Bull have, I think, if they actually could change it because obviously Hamilton and Leclerc, but Hamilton got disqualified here last year at Cota because the car was running too close to the ground. They were banging the floor, loads of sparks. And honestly, that seemed to continue on some level, right? Like Mercedes did run their car hella low to the grounds. This, you know, so many sparks in sector one, an incredibly rapid car in sector one, like Hamilton's purple sector one in the final part of sprint qualifying was quicker than anyone's by quite some margin, but um, not quick enough as it turned out with the way the rest of the lap concluded. But Hamilton had a big spin early on because the car just bottomed out as he was passing another car. But after the end of uh, the first practice session, the only practice session of the weekend, Carlos Sainz with a 133.6, a pretty competitive time in the grand scheme of qualifying as all we'll get to in a second. Both Ferraris up here, Max was third, then it was the two McLarens, then it was the two Mercedes, and then a Haas, and that's definitely relevant. It seems like for the Haas guys, slapping that Toyota Gazoo racing logo on it has given them an extra couple of tenths of a second. And also Yuki and P10, worthy of note, I think Perez was... P16 in this practice session and uh, that's another key talking point of the day of course as well. After practice of course as I mentioned earlier here with the FIA taking out some sticky tape effectively to tape over these, uh, this element so Red Bull can't change it now between today and tomorrow but uh, obviously we'll see what that means when we get there. But let's talk about sprint qualifying because it was pretty dramatic. There were interesting things happening every single session. Albon spinning in the first part. Of course Piastri knocked out was a big deal here but this was early on. Magnussen early Early on was looking pretty good. The poor Sauber guys as well. Like their car is just such a tractor. It's actually so sad. But um, you know, it is what it is. And they were miles off the pace, unfortunately. But um, look, Leclerc put in a good lap. Hamilton at this point went purple set to one as he did basically every single time. And he did that again, as I say, in a couple of minutes we'll get to. And ends up actually going P1 himself. So yeah, the first part of sprint qualifying, the Mercedes was looking pretty good on the medium tyres. Of course, they get one set of mediums to run in one set of tyres in each part of sprint Quality. A set of mediums in SQ1, a set of mediums in SQ2, and a set of soft in SQ3. That's all you can use. No tire changes, no second chance, really. There is a second chance, especially on the mediums, but um, you can't really get a lap time deleted. You can't really mess up your lap. You've got to keep it to some degree within the limits, because if you don't, you can be out of there, right? But it looked like a straight-up fight. I mean, like, obviously, Hamilton, Leclerc, Norris, Verstappen would eventually put in a, a better lap on his second attempt to get through, but um, right near the top of the timesheets. And the Red Bull did look pretty damn planted in Verstappen's hands today. Not too many corrections. It was pretty rapid in sector one. Definitely they've got the Red Bull, I think, dialed in better with these new upgrades they've brought on the car. And I think, you know, whatever the front bib situation is, there's no doubt to me that the upgrades Red Bull have brought do seem to have taken them a step forward. The McLaren upgrades, not so much. Their car seemed like a real handful. And even though Norris was still putting in good laps and Piastri was occasionally... It wasn't consistent enough. I mean, Piastri was like three or so tenths down on just Norris in sector one. And that's confidence, a lot of it, especially if the car isn't so you know good underneath you. In the final corner, Piastri then goes wide, gets his lap time deleted, gets all out of shape and ends up 16th and out of SQ1. So this is what we were talking about with McLaren, right? I theorize that, yes, they would bring their upgrades, but it's always a risk because they held off on some of these upgrades for some time because they weren't sure if they were going to deliver. And honestly, they the upgrades they brought might still be great and McLaren might still be the fastest car. But of course, when you've got one session of practice to set it up, a brand new raft of upgrades, it's incredibly difficult to get that bang on. And clearly McLaren haven't done so. Now, after sprints, after the sprint tomorrow, obviously Park Ferme reopens going into quality. So it's possible that tomorrow night after quali we're having a different discussion on the McLaren, but right now it wasn't looking great. And after SQ2, as I say, Science puts in a good lap, the Sappen puts in a good lap, but it was looking competitive. But Perez, he was the big talking point, right? Obviously in SQ1, Colopinto got through 
and Albon didn't after his spin at the end of the lap, but Perez only P10, basically a second tier off Max. He was talking about lacking grip, and Perez just super struggling to get anything out of the car, and guess who would go on to knock him out of sprint qualifying too? If you guys didn't watch qualifying and are just using this video to recap, then I'll give you a few seconds to guess. The answer, of course, being none other than Yuki Tsunoda, who comes through with a 134 flat and a couple of tenths ahead of Lawson, which is pretty impressive just because Lawson Lawson has like a 60 place penalty for the race on Sunday because he's taken all new engine parts. And obviously, you know, Lawson brand new engine, Sonoda not a brand new engine. So you'd think that'd give advantage to Liam to some capacity. But um, no, couple of tenths Sonoda puts on him, couple of tenths he puts on Perez and knocks Perez out of qualifying. So, you know, big deal as ever. Colo Pinto, though, what a performance continuing on from him. He gets through to SQ3, and these were your drivers there, including the Haas drivers. One of the big dramas, though, was this. And Mercedes decided effectively you get one lap. I mean, they fueled up for only one lap. The tyres are only really capable of delivering one good lap. I think in Hamilton's case, they probably would have liked to go again, but I just don't, I believe, according to the radio messages, they just didn't have the fuel. So, because Hamilton obviously made a mistake on his lap here, we'll discuss in a second, and I think he would have wanted to go again because he probably could have done better even on the same set of tyres. But just wasn't fueled, it seems, to make it possible to do another run. But again, Colo Pinto through both hats is through was like super cool to see how that turned out but um yeah Hamilton was rapid in the first sector mega obviously um well sector one and then crucially Colopinto spins off ahead of him and the yellow flag comes out as Colopinto spins off into turn nine turn ten whatever this corner is I think that affects Hamilton's braking zone it may not have done it may just have been a distraction because Colopinto was like sitting right here as Hamilton was coming to the corner gets it a bit wrong locks up a little bit manages to save it but um loses like half a second in that corner right and even Mercedes tweeted out has to lift for a spinning Williams on his run and that spoiled his lap so um yeah and I think that was I think he had to lift and then he messed up the corner anyway so he lost half a second there half a second in the final sector because the the tires weren't so happy with him and um yeah Hamilton went from being a few tenths up on Russell after the first sector looking great for pole position actually Mercedes looked really strong before then it goes wrong now to be fair to Mercedes it seems like you know, on some level they got the call right to send the guys out early because it's pretty rare usually sq3 they just all wait for the final two minutes send their guys out and do the one lap they have whereas mercedes said we don't think there's going to be much track evolution here we're just going to send the guys out right now of course as it turned out they got hamilton in this window right behind the williams which ends up costing him pretty badly so um yeah that was maybe just unfortunate but it still doesn't paint the best light the best light on mercedes right obviously hamilton was like you know what are we doing can we not go again but there was no time to refuel in the ends and taking advantage of that situation Max Verstappen again was the cream rising to the top I mean we've not talked we've talked a lot about Max obviously but you know I think it's days like this that show just the class of driver that he actually is especially in a car that's been here there and everywhere over the last few weeks they've put an upgrade on and he's back on some sort of pole position for the first time in a while Leclerc Norris Sainz none of them really put in a great lap Hamilton of course would be gutted that he ends up down in seventh despite the fact that he knows he easily had a good enough lap today for pole position in there for the sprint tomorrow. But yeah, Norris will be thinking, damn, not the car performance they were looking for at all. A couple of tenths off the pace, not where they've been at all over the last few rounds. What a result from a Hulkenberg as well. Three tenths, three and a half tenths off pole in a Haas in P6. Like that is so good. And, um, you know, just super impressive what Haas are capable of doing here. Both cars into SQ3, super exciting story. But uh, yeah, Maximilian Verstappen back on pole position. Of course, he was buzzing about it as well and for very good reason. And I think Max will be very confident to need after today that this is going to be his driver's championship. The big debate is, are we going to see anything tomorrow that indicates that the drama of the last couple of days has actually got some footing in reality? So very much to read your thoughts as ever on all of this stuff in the comment section below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care and I'll see you next time.